Sometimes you gotta lay down the law, and today we're doing so in regards to the story of Fire Emblem with a handy little tier list. My name is Tom, otherwise known as Titanium Legman, and welcome back to the channel. Who's ready for a little bit of tier list action? Me, you, everybody should be. I know I don't do them very often, but, you know, every once in a while I see someone making tier lists about things that I feel particularly passionate about on Twitter or in Discord, things like that, and I decided, you know what? Today's going to be the day where I have a little bit of a response to those. A couple weeks ago, people were doing some slightly satirical, slightly serious tier lists about the story of Fire Emblem on Twitter, and uh, I were some hot takes. There were some hot takes out there. So today, I'm going to put down what I consider to be the definitive tier list from S through D of the mainline Fire Emblem games, and uh, what ones are good, what ones are bad, what ones kind of set the baseline. So if you enjoy this type of content, discussion of Fire Emblem, turn-based st strategy RPGs, I guess tier lists, even though they're not a thing that I normally do, then a like and a subscription on this video would be very much appreciated. Thank you so much. Starting right, right off, we're going to go through in order from the very beginning of the series to the very end. We're going to be starting, of course, with Marth's release, Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon. Now, note, this tier list did have a number of other games on it as well, such as the side games like Encore, Warriors, Heroes, all that type of stuff. We're not talking about those. Uh, and it also had the original three games that got remade in like Marth's two releases and Almond Celica's game, Echoes. We're not going to be talking about them separately from the new versions of them because while well, there's a lot of gameplay changes, the story, functionally identical. Just really more fleshed out in the newer releases because they're bigger games that could afford to have more text space. So uh, I've taken out the original versions. You can see they're here in the remade section. We'll be still talking about them just with the new ones, just to declutter the list a little bit. So starting off with Shadow Dragon, Marth's release, the very first Fire Emblem game ever made. It's, it's fine. <laughs> it's a very basic game, very basic story. Young Prince gets ousted from his kingdom, needs to put together an intrepid group of former soldiers and allies, ne'er-do-wells, bandits, and the like to go and reclaim his family's sword, reclaim the kingdom, slay a dragon, and uh, overthrow a dark wizard while he's at it. A very simple type of story, especially for its era, but there's nothing wrong with it. There's absolutely zero issue that I have with anything in the Arcanea series, anything to do with Shadow Dragon. And I think it sets a very solid baseline for what the most basic of Fire Emblem stories should be and kind of establish a lot of the tropes that we now either play into or play against for the sake of subversion of expectations and all that type of stuff. So we're going to rest this solidly in B tier. No complaints, but it doesn't do anything particularly special either. Moving on to Fire Emblem Echoes, Shadows of Valencia, what was known as Fire Emblem Gaiden. This is Alm and Celica's first and only release. And this one is where we start to see a little bit more of an evolution and nuance compared to the more basic overall story of the original Fire Emblem. Here we have a story of two dragons, one sort of dark, the other sort of light, although we come to learn that... They really are imperfect beings, just like anything else, as well as two heroes who wind up having connections to those dragons, to those rulers and gods, and how those connections wind up playing into their, not just character evolution, but overall branching storylines as well. This is our first example of a branching narrative, and potentially, depending on how you look at it, a path split in Fire Emblem, something that we would see plenty of going further into the series. And it did a lot for bringing storytelling forward in the series in a way that is important because the story of Fire Emblem is a huge part of it nowadays. With the conflict between kingdoms and a greater sense of world building due to the fact that you know some of Duma's followers value strength overall, but maybe don't have as much arable land or available resources, which leans into their warmongering ways. Whereas Mila's servants have less of an interest in combat and plenty of verdant, fertile land that they can utilize for the growth of their civilization, which then, of course, will come under attack by Duma's followers. It's a very natural and simple evolution for how a story would be driven to a point of conflict, but it does work very well for bringing that story forward and leading to a number of different clashes for the sake of tactical battle, as well as conflict between our favorite characters. So uh, if Shadow Dragon is a basic B then I would say the Echoes has to be A because it does everything that Shadow Dragon does while adding a bunch more without anything really failing to work. You know, there's maybe a couple of slightly ham-fisted moments with, like, 
you know, Celica being forced to work for Duma, yada, 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 things like that. But for the time, interesting enough plot points, and I don't think they've aged terribly poorly. So we're going to go ahead and drop this into A tier. Now, of course, as I go through and add different games to different tiers, I might shift things up and down. That's how these things work. So not necessarily set in stone just yet. Moving on to Mystery of the Emblem, the remake of Fire Emblem 3. This is the second of Marth's games, the second in the Arcanea series. And I have to say, I'm honestly not as big on Mystery of the Emblem as I am on Shadow Dragon. Shadow Dragon serves as a very good baseline, and it doesn't do anything particularly right or wrong. Whereas Mystery of the Emblem just, it kind of feels like it's rehashing the same ground, but with an added, oh, did betrayal by a important ally because they get corrupted and possessed like it feels like just another reason to revisit Marth's games and Arcanea and doesn't really do a whole lot for that world or those characters beyond that it's not necessarily bad I wouldn't say that it has a negative impact on the overall experience of the game, unlike some other games that we will be talking about further down the list. But it does feel reductive. So I don't think I can justify putting it in B tier. I think it has to be C tier, just down below Shadow Dragon. Not offensive in any way, but we've been here before, you know? I think that's where that can easily settle. Now, we're moving on to where story really took to the fore with Fire Emblem, and that's going to be the case going forward for the rest of these games, but we Fire Emblem 4, Genealogy, The Holy War, it stands out, and for good reason. Genealogy introduced the very first instance of marriage and child units with a bit of a time skip partway through the game to allow for said units to exist, you know, not timey-wimey shenanigans like some latter games would introduce, and it really saw one of the first, I think, ever personally introductions of a truly deep rich involved world in a way that a lot of turn-based strategy games hadn't really seen up to this point and i would say maybe a lot of just jrpgs and rpgs in general hadn't seen up to this point genealogy is famous for how deep and rich its lore is and how in-depth all of the explanations and insights we get into all the various factions and countries and leaders can be, especially once you consider the fact that we then have a massive time skip to introduce a whole new cast of characters to continue said story and all of the consequences of their parents' actions of the older now characters in the story who are still influencing that world. All of those consequences come trickling down and lead to such a natural evolution of the story compared to what it could have been. It could have been very simple, but those story beats were kept in mind. The actions of characters like Sigurd and Deirdre and Arvis are very, very apparent in Gen 2, and it really helps to make the whole thing come together in a way that is not easy to do. Uh, without getting into specific story spoilers or just recapping the whole story, I think it's safe to say that Genealogy has one of the best stories in Fire Emblem, if not the best. I'm sure there are plenty of people who would feel that it is the best. And it really makes the world that it exists in so much stronger for it. So I don't think I can justify putting it anywhere else other than S tier. This is the pinnacle. Genealogy of the Holy War is phenomenal. And there's a reason that I and so many others are really, really hoping that that rumored remake winds up coming to us at some point here. We have to see. But yeah, S tier. No doubt about that. Genealogy is phenomenal. And just well, one, one last thing I have to say about it before we move on to Thracia 776 is just the fact that it was not afraid to really go for some of the darker fantasy themes that are now super popular, right? Especially in the West, but just in general with things like Game of Thrones and even Lord of the Rings in a lot of ways bringing much darker, more adult themes to what at the time were seen as games for kids by so many people. And doing that when it was not yet popular, when it was not yet kind of the thing to do as it is today, 
was ballsy and I think it really helped to elevate Fire Emblem as a whole into something that was a, viewed as a vehicle for good storytelling that I don't know we would have gotten to without a drastic step like that. So really, just for the sake of innovation alone, Genealogy deserves to stand at the top. On top of the fact that its own story and character writing is excellent. So yeah, absolutely top tier. Can't put it anywhere else. Uh, moving on to Thracia 776, the sort of midquel to genealogy. Uh, if you didn't know, Thracia 776 actually takes place in between sort of the generations that occur in genealogy. Uh, it stars main character Leaf and his entourage, who actually you can use in battle in genealogy, and shows a lot of what's happening in his country with his people, partially as a consequence of what's going on in genealogy. And it's just... It's so interesting. We haven't seen anything else really like this, except for maybe something like Three Houses due to the complexity of its narrative ever again in Fire Emblem. The fact that we have a number of characters who we knew previously from genealogy, but we actually get to see what it is that they've been up to in the middle of that story and how the story of a completely separate game came to cause enough conflict in the world that another fully fledged story could be born from it in the midst of its own story like again we're talking about things that we typically only see in long standing movie series or novels where you have so much more time and space to really explore what is happening in a world due to the actions of the most powerful and influential people in it that's hard to do in games, even today. And while, yes, it's not like Theracia was a story that existed within genealogy in terms of the game, it does exist within it in terms of the story. And just that alone puts it up near the top. Uh, that said, I'm not as invested in the story of Theracia. It is a smaller story than genealogy, for sure. Uh, it does get into a lot more of the nitty-gritty details of war and kingdom management and some of the terrible things that happen in a kingdom during war, as opposed to some of the more overarching fantasy themes that genealogy does, which I do think gives it a lot of points. But for me personally, it doesn't, qu stay, it doesn't stand quite as tall as genealogy does. And the fact that so much of its story is rooted in genealogy makes me feel like it's not quite right to put it in the same tier. It's a phenomenal story. I really don't have any major issues with it, but it is a part of a greater whole. And I think I like the overall story and themes of genealogy just a little bit more. So we're going to put Theracia in a, it's a phenomenal story. Don't get me wrong. You could absolutely make a case that it stands or that it could stand in s as well but i think for now i'm gonna leave it in a we'll see if i wind up changing my mind and switching it around down the line moving out of the snes era we're moving on to the gba era what many people consider to be the golden age of fire emblem and the pinnacle of its games now that said i am gonna say outright right now the story of the gba games don't they they don't really stand as tall as some of the SNES games, I don't think. And there's probably a lot of reasons why that is, partially because they were introducing this series to a whole new generation. It was when the game started coming over to the West as well. So there's a lot more instances of simplifying things to bring new players, both East and West, into the series. So I think that might have a little bit of a part to play, but just as an overall kind of overview of my feeling about the story of these three games. But starting off, we have Fire Emblem 6, The Binding Blade. This is Roy's game, for those of you who are not familiar with him from anything other than Super Smash. This is where he originates from. And Binding Blade is, again, a very solid story. It walks a lot of the same roads that Shadow Dragon did with an invading army, ousting a young prince from his kingdom, him having to put together, once again, a ragtag army of big, or brigands, bandits, Soldiers from his kingdom, allies from other kingdoms, random mercenaries and people he picks up on the road, and figure out how he can bring that all together to overthrow the evil dictator, save his kingdom, and the rest of the continent as well. But what I like about Binding Blade is, as a newer game at the time in the series, it had a lot of opportunities to draw on the experience of its predecessors, 
and take different steps while still walking a similar path. Uh, the biggest change here is the introduction of the legendary weapons that you had to go around and gather to unlock the actual true ending in the last couple of missions of the game. And that alone, I think, gives it a bit more punch. We didn't really see alternate endings or things like that that much in the previous games in the series. So actually having to go out of your way, take on more challenging missions, find special weapons that you then need to make sure that you didn't accidentally break through using them, and then go and fight not just the final boss, but the secret final final boss, really kind of elevated the whole conflict. Like, oh, we're actually getting to the root of what's happening here. Because of these changes, I do really enjoy Binding Blade, but the issue is that the general story and character writing leading up to that kind of big change for the series is just fine. Like, a lot of these characters don't really stand out. They do feel fairly similar to counterparts that you can see existing in prior games in the series. It doesn't feel that distinct from things that Fire Emblem had previously done. And as sort of a reboot of the series on a new console with potentially a new generation of players, that's fine for getting them into the series, but it doesn't feel distinct enough from Shadow Dragon to let me put it any higher than B. So I think that's where it's going to sit. It's a perfectly functional story. But of the three stories on the GBA in particular, I think it's the weakest, and I don't think it really stands out that much from what Shadow Dragon did prior. So B is where it's going to be, I think. Moving on to Fire Emblem 7, The Blazing Blade, the first official release in the West, and for many people, myself not quite included because I started with Sacred Stones, but for many people, their first introduction to Fire Emblem as a whole. And in terms of evolution of story, this is where we start to see some real changes and some real innovation in terms of what Fire Emblem stories could be. Uh, this is a prequel to Binding Blade, and we see a lot of the same characters in their younger years come forward to tell their story. Characters like Elwood and Hector, who were just kind of side characters in Binding Blade, come to the fore as main characters, and we really get to see a lot more of their personalities and their stories unfold as a result. The fact that we get to see so much more about the Dragon War, those survivors of it, including, you know, Manakeet and the land of Arcadia and the evolution of Nurgle as a final boss who has these like homunculi, not quite necromancy puppets, but like pretty similar morphs. It's just, it's very, very cool. Hadn't really seen anything like it in Fire Emblem up to this point. And I think it does kind of help to move the story a little bit past what Shadow Dragon and Binding Blade did. So I feel co pretty comfortable putting this in A tier. I don't really have any issues. Like the characters to me are far more memorable. Elliewood, Lynn, and Hector stand out so much compared to Roy and his entourage of brigands and ne'er-do-wells and his small harem that he wound up gathering over the course of the game, intentionally or otherwise. And a lot of the side characters that we see in Blazing Blade help to really stand out as well. So many Fire Emblem's memes originate in Blazing Blade, and I think that's indicative of a really strong story with really strong characters. So A feels like a very comfortable spot for me, and I think it will be for a lot of you as well. Next up we have Sacred Stones, my personal entry into the series Fire Emblem 8, and if Blazing Blade is A rank, I think Sacred Stones absolutely is as well. Sacred Stones truly feels like the pinnacle of what storytelling was in the era of the GBA for Fire Emblem. Again, we have a branching narrative with two potential heroes that you can go back and forth between, that you choose between on which route you want to go on. You actually see completely different sides of the story that complement each other very, very well once you have played both routes, depending on whether you're playing as Erica or as a frame. And we see an actual new plot device in the Sacred Stones themselves. Still very Fire Emblem, but very, very different in terms of lore and execution compared to anything else that we had really seen in the series up to this point. The existence of the Demon King, who's not a dragon at all, but just actually like a giant Cthulhu Eldritch God-esque beast was awesome. And the fact that we actually had so much interaction with enemies who became allies or enemies who we desperately wanted to make an ally once again that we could not in terms of Prince Leon really added so much emotional depth to the story 
compared to a lot of the previous entries. I would say really only Genealogy and Theracia achieve that same level of emotional impact due to actually getting to know our antagonists and our villains and in some of them actually kind of caring about them and it being a tragedy that we still wind up having to put them down that we can't save everybody and a good story is going to have moments like that there's going to be times where you just can't save everyone you don't have a perfect golden happy ending but can still achieve a happy ending, a measure of peace, a resolution to the story that feels satisfying. And I think Sacred Stones does a very, very good job of that. Again, a lot of memorable characters here. Some of my absolute favorite characters in the series. My own bias, of course, being acknowledged since Sacred Stones is my favorite game in the series. It is my first game in the series. But it really just did so much and it does really feel like intelligence systems learned so so much from the previous seven entries in the series and the previous two entries on the gba to really bring the best story that they could forward for a handheld console so if again blazing blade is in a rank i think sacred stones is as well it doesn't quite achieve that same level of world building that genealogy does it's a much smaller story overall compared to that sweeping narrative but it's phenomenal, and I really don't have any complaints with it. So A is where it's going to sit. Moving on, we have Fire Emblem Path of Radiance, Fire Emblem 9. This is Ike's first game and is generally considered to be one of the best games in the series. And I think that's a very, very fair assessment to give it, both in terms of character writing, story writing, and, of course, gameplay. Uh, Path of Radiance, again, serves as a kind of soft reboot. We're going on to, once again, a main series of consoles rather than handheld consoles, introducing a whole new continent, whole new mechanics, systems, all that type of stuff, and along with it, a whole new world and new stories. I think Path of Radiance is another step of maturation for the series where we really see so much more care and attention put into our main cast as well as the side characters. It's one of the first points where we really start to see a lot of side characters coming into their own as characters in their own right, not just units with a name and a face and a little bit of dialogue to make them unique that are otherwise disposable on the battlefield, right? Like, I can't really think of a single character that I don't like in some capacity who doesn't have some level of autonomy from all of their fellows due to their own unique character traits without just being caricatures as kind of started to happen a little bit later on in the series with some of the latest titles. The story of the Lagoos and the Bjork or the humans and the subhumans and how that conflict shaped the world as it is in time of the game, the overall influence of gods and goddesses without being directly involved in the story at this point, but still seeing things like blessed armor and weapons that drastically swings power levels and how people are able to play around that how different kingdoms can have different influences on each other based in more real-world politics, or at least real-world politicking, compared to just, well, the army of Burn has a bunch of wyvern riders and their king hates humans, so they're just gonna go overrun the world and try to just take it over and wipe out humanity. Like, no, there's a lot more play here from dukes and kings and leaders and rulers and mercenary bands and senates in just wanting power and wanting influence and you know the conflict with the heron clan of the serenus forest and how their experience at the hands of the benyon empire just had a little bit of extra world building in the background that didn't come to the fore in path of radiance but would very much do so in radiant dawn you could see how much world there was even if it wasn't directly relevant to the story of path of radiance and that helps immensely because it allows the writers to do so much more with their side characters as well as the overall narrative. So I really do think that Path of Radiance sits very strongly in A tier. I don't think it quite breaks S because it doesn't get quite as deep, but it does everything right. And to me, that puts it in A rank. A phenomenal story, great characters. I highly recommend it to anyone and everyone. Now, this next opinion might get me into a little bit of hot water, and the rest of the games on the series might do that in general due to my opinions on them, but that's what we're here for. You can debate me in the comments if you like. Let me know. Just be respectful, or try to be, at least. Otherwise, I will clap back at you. Radiant Dawn, the sequel to Path of Radiance, and the much bigger, grander story, in my opinion, a lot more in the vein of genealogy than 
Path of Radiance is more focused, grounded hero story featuring Ike. Radiant Dawn is notable for doing a lot of really cool, impressive things that I want to see make a return in the series. The fact that we have four separate acts with completely different characters and armies who are representative of some of the biggest and most important factions throughout the entire story who absolutely are at odds with one another and you actually see that come into play in battles where you wind up having to fight the characters that you were like raising for 10 chapters prior to going into a new act and suddenly oh my god I have to fight them that's terrifying <laughs> it adds so much emotional depth because again like some of the best stories in Fire Emblem are the ones where we actually get to meet and to know our villains and our antagonists. Sacred Stones does this very well with the Kingdom of Grado and its generals and Prince Leon. Genealogy of the Holy War does this very well due to the fact that we have betrayals and new alliances made and again this generation gap that allows some of the characters who we got to know either growing into allies if they used to be enemies or growing very much into antagonists and villains when we used to count on them as allies in a very natural way, Radiant Dawn does that as well. Actually being able to see inside the heads of characters who otherwise just would have been NPCs or villains is so good for building an understanding of the world and its overall story. And it leans so much into this idea that in Path of Radiance and Radiant Dawn, war is the apocalypse. To make a long story short, basically, if conflict comes to too much of a head, bad things are going to happen. And a lot of the overall story of both games is trying to keep that from happening, whether it be just people acting behind the scenes or eventually, more overtly, you the player and your army working to avert it near the end of Radiant Dawn. And that being the overall goal and story makes it so much more impactful when you can look at it and think back and say, wow, I can absolutely see why so many of these characters were pushed by the powers that be into fighting each other to further this goal of destruction and doom and how their biases and opinions and worldviews and just their experiences and trauma were played to get them to actually fight each other to push them into conflict that they very well otherwise might never have gone to and that's so so cool it doesn't always have the best character writing and there's characters that are introduced in radiant dawn that are not nearly as memorable or impactful as characters in path of radiance but the overall world building and narrative and much like with the second generation of genealogy the way that narrative and these characters are put into positions that they otherwise may not have been if they just stood on their own as a story, but because they're actually being referenced to the past events that they experienced in Path of Radiance, they are pushed forward in a way that makes sense into a very different and new place. Just the fact that you have an entire character in Micaiah whose whole story is based on the fact that Ike's actions in the first game put her and her people and her kingdom on the back foot in a way that she has to work really hard to overcome her resentment of. It's not Ike's fault. Obviously, if you've played Path of Radiance, you know he was just trying to fight to defend an innocent kingdom and its people from a mad invading ruler. But in any war, it's the actions of the terrible elite that wind up falling back on their people. But their people don't always see it that way and see the people who defeated them, justified or not, as the villains and lean into that rage and resentment and anger and there's not a lot else that we see in fire emblem that does that the only other really good examples are fates and three houses which i'm going to talk about in a minute but i love the way it's executed on radiant dawn so i think this is going to be our second s rank here i absolutely love these stories i absolutely love these characters and the way it's all brought together at the end and we can see a lot of these characters overcome their differences and realize why it's important to do so, to live and let live, to forgive and forget, all that type of stuff. It's very satisfying. So I gotta give Radiant Dawn the S rank. Moving on to the modern era, shall we say, of Fire Emblem. We have Fire Emblem Awakening, the game that saved the series and weirdly to a lot of people is considered to have kind of a bad story 
but I don't see that at all. I do not agree with that sentiment. It was a Hail Mary, a, a throwback to the fans, right? Because the series was dying. As far as we knew, Fire Emblem Awakening was going to be the last game that we ever had. So Intelligent Systems threw everything in the kitchen sink at the wall to see what would stick, to show their appreciation for a history of fans. And it worked, man. Not only did it work for us, but it worked for a whole new generation of people as well. And it's satisfying because unlike things like Binding Blade, that clearly draw a lot of inspiration from the Arcanea games, from Marth's stories, and walk those same paths with some slight differences, but overall are not as innovative as I think they needed to be. Awakening literally references all of those events. We see characters such as Tiki come back, like the literal exact same characters who reference things that happen in these first games that in story took place 2000 years ago. And yet we see so much that's new and different while we're still walking a lot of those same paths and leaning into a lot of those same tropes. Awakening does so much to differentiate itself from its predecessors before you even start introducing things like the child characters and how they come in due to timey-wimey shenanigans as opposed to genealogy having a natural time skip that allowed these characters to grow into their own warriors and everything. And I think that's where a lot of people kind of get thrown off. You know, people don't like time travel in fantasy stories. They don't like time travel in stories in general. They feel like it's a cop-out or it just it's a tool to force mechanics that otherwise wouldn't need to exist in games or shows or whatever. And when it's not done well, I can totally see that. But the thing about Awakening is it is done pretty well. All of the child units who come from the future to fight in the past to try and avert the future that they're from are some of the most well fleshed out, well thought out characters, in my opinion, in the series. I just replayed Awakening recently because it just had been a while and I wanted to and I've also been very slowly working on a completely different video in the background that has to do with supports that may or may not be a response to a certain support video that came out a couple months ago from a popular Fire Emblem creator, but I digress. In one of the supports that I'd never gotten before, I had a conversation between Gregor and Inigo. Gregor being, you know, the rough and tumble Russian-esque mercenary who I had married to Olivia to, of course, give birth to Inigo. And it was very interesting because the conversation centered around Inigo's womanizing, right? His flirtatious nature, his easygoing, devil-may-care attitude, even on the battlefield, and how, as a grizzled mercenary, Gregor knows that that is an attitude that could very easily and would presumably get Inigo killed. And he loses his cool with an ego. He snaps at him, scolds him, tells him he needs to drop this act, that he needs to take things a lot more seriously. And for the f one of the first times ever, that was the moment when an ego actually got serious. I never remember seeing him actually drop the act until this point. And he fired back at his father about the fact that this persona is one he carries to inspire the people around him. You know, where he's from, the future that he's from, very few people were strong enough to even hold a sword, let alone be the hero that the world needed. But Inigo was one of them. And so with so many eyes on him and so many expectations weighing him down, he felt that the only way that he could bear it and the only way he could inspire hope in those around him, which they desperately needed, was to show that kind of lackadaisical, whimsical, goofy kind of flirtatious atmosphere. Like, oh yeah, you know, the world is ending, we're in the middle of a zombie apocalypse, the dark god has arisen and is slowly wiping everything out. But, you know, I still have time in my day in between slaying zombies to hit on the local ladies, try and find someone to warm my bed at night. And I mean, if I can do that, then we're all gonna be fine, right? And he laid that on his father really hard, and it made Gregor take a step back. And that's not something that I was expecting. It was a very, very good moment, and it really well encapsulated the overall approach of Awakening. With its base characters and the beginning of the story, it feels like it's retreading a lot of the series' roots, which makes sense for a kind of capping off Hail Mary game in this series that's dying, right? 
Go back to what we love. Go back to what the fans know. And tell that story one more time, but bigger and better. But then when we introduce the dark future and all of these characters that come from it and how their actions in the current timeline may avert it, may not, and how the villains start to play around that and everything starts to evolve, it shows such a depth of narrative that while I can understand if people don't like the time travel aspect, I don't really think it's fair to argue that it wasn't done well. There's times where time travel is not done well. It's the majority of them in any sort of fiction, in any sort of media. But I don't think this is one of those instances. And while there's not quite as much depth of world building as we see in things like Genealogy and Radiant Dawn, I do think the story that exists in a more focused way rocks. So this is going to be an a rank title for me. It's not quite S. And there's definitely some goofiness in there that feels a little bit kooky. That makes it not quite as much of a masterpiece as Radiant Dawn and Genealogy, but it's really damn good. Moving on, we have our last three games in the mainline series, and technically we have five to rank here, but Fates is going to be encapsulated a little bit by the fact that, of course, it's just branching sides of the same narrative, even though it's technically three separate games. Starting off, we have Birthright. And before I even begin here, like, I know this is going to be the section of the video that gets me in the most hot water because to this day, conversation around the story of Fates is some of the most toxic stuff I have ever seen <laughs> in Fire Emblem fandom ever. So I know that people are going to disagree with what I have to say, but I got to say it. Try to temper yourselves a little bit. You can absolutely disagree with me. That's fine. You can express that disagreement, but let's not start a flame war in the comments, okay? Birthright. Birthright is in a lot of the same ways as Mystery of the Emblem, just kind of a Fire Emblem story, but worse. It doesn't really stand out in any meaningful way from what Shadow Dragon or Binding Blade did. You are part of this kingdom that has been invaded again and again by the opposing kingdom. It seems like there's barely anything that your people have done wrong at all, and you're just kind of pushing back against the tide and putting your forces together and winning the day. Getting revenge for your mom, and that's it. The Hoshiden characters, with some exceptions in terms of like the royals and a couple side characters, don't really stand out that much in terms of the overall cast of Fates. And the story that's there is just very, very basic. I really don't, I don't dislike it, but there's nothing I like about it either, really. And of the three routes in Fates, Hoshido and Birthright are the one that I'm always the least interested in replaying. Not only because it's got the simplest, most easy gameplay of the three, but I'm just not compelled by Hoshido and its characters. It's cool to see a proper nation based on feudal Japan-esque aesthetics and tropes and designs and type of character. But that's really all it's got going for it. So it's not terrible. It's not something that belongs in like D, but I don't think I can put it any higher than C. Now, moving on to Conquest. <laughs> Contrary to what most people have to say, I really, really like the story of Conquest and its characters. Actually kind of playing the bad guys in a lot of ways, or at least playing characters who are stuck in a kingdom that is the bad guy, is so interesting. It's something that I've been looking for in Fire Emblem as a series for a really, really long time. And just seeing the way that Norian nobles and their entourages, their retainers, have to play around like the madness of King Garon and his truly despicable 
like bootlickers in terms of his actual like royal court and generals and everything and how they can try to mitigate some of the atrocities that the Norian kingdom committed and continued to commit throughout the story is awesome. They're not always the best characters, right? Like, yeah, okay. Characters like Camilla are basically just like the flirty mommy archetype. They have depth to them, but only if you get certain supports and things like that. But just seeing the way that Karin and Xander, Leo, Elise, and Camilla, and all those around them had to fight not only to survive, but try to undercut their father and prevent even more tragedies from occurring, that was interesting to me. Combine that with just the overall darkness of the story, just in terms of its tone. Like, it's not nearly as brutal as something like, say, genealogy in any way, but actually, like, literal dark. Actually having a less colorful, less bright and fun world and actually feeling a bit more actually having it feel a bit more like something like the world of berserk obviously not in terms of its actual like world building but just the overall view of it and design of it made it so much more interesting and it made that kind of feeling of oppression that the characters were going through during the whole story feel so much better so uh it's not as well written as something like Echoes or Path of Radiance or anything like that, but it's definitely quite solid. I, I would put it in B tier for sure. Finally, in terms of Revelation, Revelation is a bit more of a bit mixed bag. I really like all of the story beats that get into the Kingdom of Vala and how that kingdom and Anankos and everything going on with it is what drives the overall conflict of Fates. And while there are definitely ways that it could have been executed on better, I don't think it's bad at all. I know, again, a lot of people don't like the idea of, like, you literally can't talk about this place, there's a curse, yada, 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 so that's what drives the conflict forward, but I've never understood that. Like, it's as good a reason as any to have two peoples and two nations wind up coming into conflict with each other, having this shadowy third organization, third country behind the scenes that, due to, you know, magic that can do literally anything, not being able to be discussed and forcing conflict forward for its own machinations, that's interesting to me. I like that. I don't know. Maybe maybe, maybe y'all are going to disagree with that. I know y'all are going to disagree with that, but I think it's cool. I like it, and it's my list, and it's my video. So I'm going to put Revelations in B as well. It's definitely way, way more interesting than Birthright, and it does a lot of things different, and I don't think executes on them terribly. So that's where it's going to sit. Moving on to our final two entries here, Three Houses and Engage. If we're talking about depth of world building and complexity of character interactions and being able to play the bad guy and all of these different things, I don't think you can look to a better example of how to make that happen in the modern day than Three Houses. I know there are gameplay issues that people have with Three Houses, even though I don't really agree with those, but I've typically seen nothing but praise for the story, for these characters. The fact that everything changes depending on which house you pick. The fact that every single character has such depth to them in terms of their interactions with each other, in terms of reacting to the world around them and how those reactions change based on what other characters are with them or whether they're just allied with you or they're directly under your control or even they're opposed to you. And seeing the way the world evolves during and after the time skip is just so, so good. We learn so much about the continent and the world and all the different kingdoms of Fargus and the Alliance and the Empire and all of the different characters that stem from different areas of the world and have completely different backgrounds. It's just so well done. I don't really know that anything other than maybe genealogy reached the same levels. I think it, the world's definitely more fleshed out than Radiant Dawn. Radiant Dawn does a lot really, really well that I think earns it a spot in S tier as well. But genealogy and three houses have the most developed worlds of anything in Fire Emblem. And just for that alone, I think three houses have to, has to go in S tier. You know, that's to say nothing of all of the hints of other things going on behind the scenes, those who slither in the dark, the 
hints that this might actually be a post-apocalyptic world like that could have been set from our reality based on the quick glimpses that we see at the very beginning of the game. There's so much going on that makes the world feel so much bigger and more alive beyond even the sweeping scale of the story as it stands. And that story and its characters on its own already elevated to S tier. Uh, I have truly no complaints about Three Houses at all, other than the fact that Elgard's route got clearly cut short a little bit and could have used some more fleshing out, and the fact that I would have liked to have seen more about those who slither in the dark and their history and their technology levels. But at the same time, having them just stay mysterious and never quite getting fully fleshed out does add complexity to the world that I appreciate. So I really can't levy any major complaints about the story of Three Houses. It's phenomenal. Yeah, you've got a couple goofy characters like Bernadetta, but to me, that does not bring the overall thing down at all. It's by far one of the best stories in Fire Emblem. Finally, we have Fire Emblem Engage. And if we're going from one of the pinnacles of the series with Three Houses... It is truly, truly a shame to fall so, so far with Engage. It's, it's D tier. And that's only because D is as low as this scale goes. It, I wouldn't put it in F if F existed because it's not a failed story. It's just, bar none, the worst story in the series. It's got some of the worst characters. It's got some of the dumbest most terrible writing decisions possible. Like, just just the fact that we go from, like, being this sleeping divine dragon who doesn't know anything, has amnesia, yada, 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 which we've already done amnesia before in Fire Emblem as well, having this dream about fighting some big bad that we don't recognize and fighting alongside Emblem Marth, which is clearly just a retread of Robin and Krom fighting Validar at the beginning of Awakening, but whatever, we'll let that slide. And it seems like, oh, well, that's just a dream, but then Marth references it like it wasn't just a dream, like it was a premonition or something we had already experienced, but then that literally never comes up again. Like, where did that go to meeting... Uh, to meeting your mom and she's like oh well this is the actual divine dragon who we're gonna like get mentored by and learn from and everything and then she just dies in the beginning of the game and like there's a death scene that we're supposed to care about even though we've known this character for all of 20 minutes and then they just time skip and it's like oh her funeral happened like in the last five minutes since she died like what it doesn't make any sense whatsoever and like just some of the the kingdoms and their motivations are just not well fleshed out at all and they could be like we see so much about how like Firine has all of this like very dark underbelly corrupt nobles you know people just having absolutely zero care for brigands and even just like criminals being slaughtered in cold blood and like all this different stuff, these little glimpses that we get, but it's so minor that it doesn't do anything to overcome the very goofy nature of the kingdom. Just some of the decisions that we see in terms of like villain motivations and God, the four hounds are just so terrible <laughs> other than Mavier, who's slightly more interesting, but just such boring, overdone, character trope driven characters and just nothing concludes in a satisfying way. It's just so goofy and over the top and I hate it. I hate it so much and it's just, it's such a far cry from anything that's been done in Fire Emblem before. Like I would so much rather have a completely basic like shadow dragon level narrative that at least takes itself seriously and has characters that we can try to care about a little bit more than just being a meme or just personal fan favorites like Boucheron who grow on you for whatever reason than whatever it is that they're trying to do with engage it sucked i hated it and 
like it's a testament to the gameplay that I played the game twice and I want to go back and play it more because the gameplay is so freaking good. But like, thank God, because the gameplay wasn't good and we also had that character writing those stories. That would have killed the series right there. <laughs> not not literally, like not actually, but God, it would have been terrible. So yeah, Engage is by far the worst story in the series. It's got some of the worst writing in the series, and I can only hope that we never see anything like it again. And with that note of negativity, <laughs> that is my Fire Emblem story tier list. I'm sure as heck expecting there to be a lot of discussion about this in the comments. By all means, go hog wild, defend your opinions. Just, I know like I was inflammatory there with Engage. I just hate it. If you like Engage, that's fine. Like, don't let me being a hater about it make you feel like you have to defend it. I totally understand if you enjoy it. And if you like the writing, you like the characters, that's totally fine. I'm not saying you can't or that you shouldn't. I just don't like it at all. But our opinions are allowed to differ on that. Let me know what your favorite games or least favorite games story-wise and character writing-wise are in the series. Let's try and have some good discussions. <laughs> I know it's hard to say that after ending on such a negative note, but like I wanted to go in chronological order, man, and Engage is just the worst one in the series, in my opinion, so like nothing I can do about that. Ugh. <laughs> oh. With that said, going to wrap this one up here. Thank you to all my patrons and my YouTube members, by the way. From Patreon, thank you to Riley Thatcher, Yoking Haddock 67 Chris Muller, Christian Soto, Kejo, Navi, Mike Ridings, 18C, and Caffeine System. And from my YouTube members, thank you. Canadian Animator Guy, Tojo Jr., Luxor, Caffeine System, Tenchi, Matthew Berry, King Tony, John Eaton, Captain Planet, Light B, Midday Moonlight, Matthew Schneider, RJD, Michael Poole, Dre, X13, Mike Ridings, Rock the Pudge, Solu, Pristinely Ungifted, Segno, Ludwig, Sulfonir, Pyro Raven, Baka Nikajaga, Raula No Commentary, Shimia Saturn, Azure Leon, and Marissa Raban. You guys really make it so much easier to keep doing this as a full-time thing. Thank you all so much for the continued support. It means the world. And if any of you all would like to show your direct support and take some of the edge off of YouTube monetization, links to both my Patreon and YouTube memberships can be found in the description. My name has been Tom, otherwise known as Titanium Legman. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all have a good night. Stay safe and healthy out there. And remember, be good to each other. Bye now.